Hello everyone! In this video, we'll make our player move. To do that, we'll have a look at variables, if statements, and player input. So if you want to make games in Unity, this video is pretty much essential. I'm ready. Are you ready? Let's go! Before we get started, I just wanted to mention that you can now download the project files and the scripts from each video over at DevAssets. So if we go to devassets.com, this is a website I created where you can download really high quality 3D models such as this Western Props Pack, we have a modern weapons bundle, some cool looking sci-fi vehicles and a lot more. If we go to browse, scroll down to the bottom here and click how to make a game, we get to this page where you can download all of this stuff. I've seen a lot of tutorial makers make their project files paid, but I don't really think that's fair to you guys. Instead, as with everything on the site here, I've made it pay what you want. So you can of course go ahead and grab it for free or choose to support me with some amount. You can just click the one that you can afford here and then hit the blue button and you're good to go. So back to the video. In the last one we made our cube fly forward by adding a force. Right now our primary issue with this is that our player doesn't stay on the ground. He just starts rotating and jumping and goes crazy. One way to fix this is to go to the player, find the rigid body and add some constraints. We could for example freeze the rotation on the x-axis and that should result in smooth movement. However, we do want our cube to be able to rotate so that when he collides with something it's going to look cool. So let's uncheck that and instead let's create a physics material. The reason for the cube jumping around is that by default there's friction between the cube and the ground. By using a physics material we can choose how much friction we want. So let's right click in the project, go create and then select physics material. We can rename this to something like slippery and we can set both the dynamic and the static friction to zero. Then we can drag this onto our ground and you can't see it being applied, but if we go ahead and select our ground, we can see that the material under the box collider is now set to slippery. And that means that if we hit play now, there's no friction between the cube and the ground and he's just going to slide off. And that's without restraining his rotation. So if we now select the player and double click on our player movement script. On this line, we're adding a forward force of 2000 and then of course multiplied with time dot delta time. However, it would be really, really neat if we were able to modify this value in the inspector instead of just hard coding this into the line. To do that, we use variables. In C Sharp, I like to think of variables like containers. Just like you can store items in a box, you can store data in a variable. In the beginning, we focus on storing simple values like numbers or text, but variables can be used to store way more complicated data. Each variable is given a name. This pretty much just means slapping a label on the container so that each time we use that name it refers to the data of the variable. We also have to specify what type of data we want to store. For starters you should learn and memorize the four fundamental data types. Integer, we just write int. This stores a whole number, it can also be negative. Float, this stores a number with decimals. String, this stores a piece of text. And boolean, we just write bool and this is the simplest of all the data types because it can only have two values, true or false. So creating a variable looks like this. Unity also allows us to edit a variable in the inspector. To do that we mark it as public. However, this variable is currently unassigned. It has no value. We can assign the variable a default value by simply typing equals and then the value. To get the value of the variable in code we simply write its name. Like here where we are printing the value 10 to the console. We can of course also edit the value of a variable. Here we set it equal to 5 and here we add 1 onto the current value making it 6. So if we want to turn this number into a variable that we can edit in the inspector, we'll go up here and create some space. We'll write public, float because we want a number that we can fine tune with decimal places. Then we need a name. In our case, we could do something like forward force and we can set a default value. In our case, we'll just set that to the same 2000. Then we can substitute this number with forward force. So we'll just take the forward force here and paste it down there. If we now save, go back into Unity, we can see that we are now able to adjust the forward force in the inspector. We could set it to 4000 or to 1000. If you click and drag on it, you can even fine tune like this. And you can even edit it while playing. So now of course we need to change this comment here. Instead we'll change it to something like add a forward force. And it's time to have a look at doing some player input. Now the fundamental thing to understand when doing player input is the if statement. If you make some room beneath our add force method here, we can write if, open and close a parenthesis, and then open and close some curly brackets. This is the basic structure of an if statement. If statements allow you to only execute code if a certain condition is met. This is where you put your code, and inside of these two parentheses is where you put your condition. Sometimes it's really simple, say comparing two numbers. We could write if 3 is bigger than 2. Of course this is always going to be true and so this will always be called. We can also say if 3 is equal to 2 
And this is of course false, so this code will not be called. We can also write other stuff, say if one is equal to two minus one, and this is of course true, or we could put not equal to, and now it's false. But this is only the stuff we can do with numbers. We can also put other stuff in here. If we want to check if the user is pressing a certain key on the keyboard, we'll go input.getKey, and here we'll also open and close a parenthesis. And in here, in quotation marks, we write the key we want. So in our case, we want D to go to the right. And now everything we put inside of these two Two curly brackets is only called when the user presses D. So we could of course just go ahead and add some more forces here. Let's say rb.addForce. And in this case, we don't want to add a force on the Z axis, we want to do it on the X, meaning right and left. So we can go in here and add some numbers, say 500. We'll then do zero on the Y and zero on the Z. Remember to close it off with a semicolon. Of course, we want to multiply our 500 with time.delta time just like we do up here. If we now save this, I'll just set the forward force to something pretty low, just so our cube doesn't go flying off. We can hit play, and we should see that when we hold down D, our cube will indeed move. So we can go back and add this to the other direction as well. To do this, we simply copy our code, paste it right beneath. Instead of checking for the D key, we'll check for A. And we still want to add a force on the X axis, but we want to do so in the opposite direction. So we'll just input a minus here. Again, we can save this, play the game, and see that we can now move in both directions. In fact, why don't we go ahead and make our movement speed adjustable in the inspector the same way we did with forward force. To do that, we just add a new public float up here and we'll call this something like sideways force. Let's just default that to 500. By the way, when we're dealing with float variables, you will notice me writing an F at the end of the number. This just signifies that we're talking about a float number. In some cases, we can leave it out, like here, but other times Unity will complain, so it's a good idea to get in the habit of just doing it every time. Again, this only applies to floats, not integers. So now we can take our sideways force and paste it instead of the 500 here, and instead of the 500 here as well. You'll notice that it's still fine putting a minus here. When we run the game, this is just going to be equal to 500, or what we said in the inspector. So let's save this. This, go back into unity and we can now see that we can adjust the sideways force as well. So let's try setting the forward force to something like a thousand and the sideways force to something like 600. And it already starts to feel like a game. If you were able to follow along with this, really good job. Programming the movement of the player is definitely not the easiest thing that you can do in Unity. And so it's always annoying that it's really the first thing that you have to do in most cases. But I hope you learned something. And remember, you don't have to understand and definitely not remember all of this the first time. I will just mention that the way that we're handling player movement here is not the most efficient way. But no one expects you to write perfect code right off the bat. I just wanted to let you know how this could be improved. There's two main problems here. The first one is how we're getting player input. Now, so using input.getKey here is totally fine, and in our case it works perfectly, but as soon as we want to do stuff like smoothing player input, supporting alternative keys, or maybe even a controller, Unity has some much better ways to handle the player input, so you can definitely look into that if you want to improve it. Also, we are currently checking for input inside the fixed update. While it's fine in our case because what we're doing is movement, and that's usually a fairly smooth thing, it's definitely not a good idea to do for stuff like jumping or other one-off events. The reason for this is that input is updated in the update method and if the fixed update runs slower you might have a situation where you actually miss some player input. First that would just mean that the input gets slightly delayed and that's why I think it's fine here. But the recommended thing to do is check for your input in the update method then store that input in some sort of variable up here. In our case that could just be two booleans called something like move right and move left that you'd set to true if the key's pressed and false if the key's released and then check if those variables are true or false down here to add a force. But I really wouldn't worry too much about that right now. So that's pretty much it for this video. If you enjoyed it make sure to to subscribe so you won't miss the next one. Also, if there's anything you would really like me to include in this mini series, definitely leave a comment and I'll see what I can do. So thanks for watching and I will see you in the next video. Thanks to all of the awesome people who donated in January and a special thanks to Derek Heemskirk, Faisal Marify, James Callahan, Robert Barnum, Peter Locke and Jason Dottito. If you want to become a patron yourself, you can do so at patreon.com slash Thanks a lot guys.